Okay, so guys, uh, hello and welcome to our today's webinar. And I'm really delighted to be here today as we are gathered for this insightful webinar on security models. Okay, so Mr. Sharma, Manoj Sharma is uh, having more than 19 plus experience in the field of cybersecurity. And uh, as in CyberNOS, we believe that uh, the, it is very critical subject, CISSP. So we are here to help you out to solve the criticality of CISSP. And today's topic is uh, our objective is uh, 3.2, which based on security models. So we'll be like touching upon various uh, concepts of cybersecurity, especially this security models. So let's get started. Okay. Uh, thanks, ma'am. Uh, thanks for that. And uh, uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome on board uh, for this particular webinar. Uh, this particular webinar is more focused on domain number three. Uh, that was, you know, we have a series of webinars going on. And this is one of them. Last In the last webinar, we have covered the fundamental architecture and design principles. And in this particular webinar, we are going to throw some light onto the security models. Now, what is expected out from a CISSP aspirant uh, from this particular module is that you should be able to recognize the security goal for each and every module. That's very important, right? Because that is where it might be a single keyword, but you will be tested on the same thing during the exam. Next is, you also need to understand the major attributes uh, of these particular models. And then how do they apply in case of, let's say, where do we implement Lipner model? Where do we implement, uh, you know, Bella Padula model and so on, right? So that is why it becomes very important for you to understand and, and you know, understand a scenario wherein a particular model is fitting up. So those kind of questions you may get in the exam right mostly on the attribute side of it okay <clears throat> with that said let's get into uh, uh, these particular security models so first we will try to understand what is actually a model okay what is meant by a model and what is a security model then so any form of model is basically a simplified format or you can say a simplified version of uh, something. And every model what we create, we create it with a particular perspective, uh, mostly uh, for testing and those kind of stuff, right? I will give you a real time example, right? For example, you want to understand how the aerodynamics of A737, Boeing 737 works. Are you going to take a Boeing A737 into the lab and test it out? may not be a right uh, picture. It may be a future version which you are making, right? And you want to try out that particular model. So in that case, what we do, instead of taking this heavy machinery and testing it out based on its complexity, we make a very simple model out of it with the right perspective, and then we start doing the testing. So that is where model helps in, in there, right? Model also helps when you are able to have a successful, uh, uh, you know, machine created or successful, uh, you know, system created. Once a system is created, you can bring out a model out of it, which you can use uh, or replicate in the near future. So that is where model plays a very, very important part. And when the same thing, when we create a particular model for a security perspective to test out a security aspect, then it is called as a security model. So on those lines, we are going to talk about, you know, few of the models today in this particular thing, in particular webinar. And you also need to understand whenever we design a particular system, first and foremost requirement is to apply fundamental design principles. That they, these kind of principles should always be there at the back of your mind. Oh. 
okay and once we create this particular system out of these security models then the very next step is to uh, go for certification because certification is a technical validation of a particular product uh, let's say a company has developed a particular system and they want to test it out they want to get it certified so that they can sell it out to other customers as well because they need to establish some kind of trust in the industry so they go with certification process okay once they go with certification process and they manoj rakshi mute, mute. Yeah. guys am i audible now yes and you are able to see my screen please confirm uh, there was some internet glitch yes okay so let's continue with that okay so this is what we are going to understand today right uh, before even i discuss this what is there on the screen i want to let you know the systems which we use those kind of systems falls under two categories one can be a single system or you can say a single user system or it can also be a multi user system right any kind of computer system can be a single user system or a multi user system what it means when we say it is a single user system it means that only one user can log on to this only one account is there which can be used on a particular system a very good example can be your disk operating system it can also be uh, you know uh, some kind of command uh, command user interface uh, operating system like that correct that is a single user system now in a single user system you don't need a high level of security because you already know only one user is going to use this particular system not many users are going to use this system the complication happens when when one single machine is being used by multiple users and it it comes down to what somebody can access versus what they cannot access so those kind of system where multiple users are there on the same system those systems are called as multi user systems or multi user machines okay now when there are multiple users on a particular machine or we can call it as a subject multiple subjects i hope you understand what is subject subject is is an active entity on a particular computer it can be a user it can be a process it can be an application anything now when these users are going to access the files which we call it as objects right so object is a passive entity on a particular system so these can be the objects it may not be necessary that all the objects may have the same classification level sometimes object have different classification level like for example in your company as well not all the file are public or not all the files are classified either so what happens is some of the file may be belonging to a different category some are belonging to a different uh, classification level or category level similarly all the users also they are not of the same privilege there might be normal user there might be power user there might be admins and so on similarly those people who are standing at the back some of them may be uh, you know at a very leadership position some of them may be on a middle manager position some of them will be at a very low uh, you know on ground kind of position so those different users or subjects they are interacting with a particular system and in those times the challenge becomes is when a particular subject access a particular object that need to be controlled that need to happen in a very very controlled manner so that there is no inappropriate access now to do so what can we do to implement such kind of measure wherein when a subject access a particular object it is always uh, you know uh, inconsistent with the security policies we need to have some fundamental security models right these are the models which has been established they are common across all the models and we will try to understand those so what are fundamental security model the first one is called as state machine model 
what is a state machine model very simple it says that your system is always in some state or the other for example when your system is shut down that is one state when you start your computer that is one state when you open a uh, word file then your system is in another state the idea here is that when a system is transitioning from one state to another it has to happen in a secure manner all the time it cannot violate security policies during that time so that is called as state machine model another fundamental security model is called as non interference model and this kind of very easy as well right we can do whatever we want to do in our own home but we should not go and poke our nose into the neighbor's room isn't it the same principle here as well a particular user is okay to do whatever they want in their own profile in their own parallel profile but they should not be able to disturb other users which are there on the same system so that is called as non interference model the third model is called as information flow model which is very simple it says that information has to flow in a manner which is inconsistent with the security policies it should not violate any security policy right so these three fundamental models are always there now on top of this fundamental models they came out with lattice based models and rule based models now what is a lattice based model a lattice means what looks like different different layers lattice means layers right so a layer based access control system means that there will be subjects who will have different clearance level people on the top will have a high clearance level people at the bottom will have low clearance level at the same time objects which are there on the system like your your folders your files or whatever you want to access passive entities right they will also be on different level it can be confidential it can be secret it can be top secret and so on so idea here is when who should be able to access which kind of uh, document who should be able to access which kind of objects that's very very important right that is what is defined in the lattice model under lattice model we have two models one is bella padula another one is viva integrity model and from a exam perspective these two are heavily heavily testable so you need to put extra effort to understand this on the other side there are certain you know uh, certain security uh, models which are focused on rule based uh, access control system that means they works on rules one of them is clark wilson and another one of them is uh, brever nash model so we are going to explore these models today so let's get into this because this area is highly testable and i see even books are not explaining them well and that is where the candidates are getting confused and this is a highly testable uh, area in the exam so people are losing out on that portion so let's try to strengthen that so when it comes to lattice based model we will talk about three models here one is bella padula viva integrity model and lipner implementation model which is nothing but a mix of viva uh, and uh, uh, you know bella padula then we have rule based system in this we have information flow system clark wilson river nash graham denning and harrison uh, russo umar models okay let's get into this a little bit more this is the first model which all of you should be very thorough from an exam perspective because this particular model is very very testable and this is focused on confidentiality actually this model was brought in by us department of defense and they were testing out this particular model on a stand alone machine and they were thinking okay how can we make sure that confidentiality is kind of taken care of and this is how this particular you know 
model has evolved over a period of time. And what it says is there are subjects and there are objects. Objects has clearance level, higher level objects, uh, higher level subject will have higher clearance, low level uh, subject will have low clearance. Similarly, objects are also very important and they are also classified. So highly important uh, objects or you can say documents are highly classified uh, and the low importance documents are low classified. So in this case, let's take an example that you have certain objects, let's say some documents which are top secret, secret and confidential on, on different different levels. And there is a user who is on a secret level, right? As you can see this mapping, he is there on a secret level. Now, while this particular subject is going to access the object, there has to be certain restrictions uh, on to how he can access certain things. So the first one, the first property is called as simple security rule. You can simply understand this, simply means read. Read security rule, which means that a particular user on a particular level should not be able to read any information which is there on the higher uh, clearance level. And that holds very good as well, because in your company as well, if you go and read what is the data which is there for the leadership, then there can be a lot of uh, chaos in the company as well, right? Because you are actually going to access some information which is not supposed to be accessed by you. So that is purely a breach of confidentiality. So the first rule is called as no read up. The second rule here is no write down. Now this is where you need to put special attention. Why this particular person is not allowed to write an information to a level which is below than him. He is the boss. He should have access to write the information over there. But actually the model does not permit it because it may happen that by mistake, this particular user who is working on a higher clearance level, he is working with secret documents, should not copy and paste or maybe reveal some information which is there on a the secret level to the confidential level. And that is why we call it as no write down or we call it as star property rule. Okay. Star means read and write. You will not have write permissions. You can have read permissions, but you will not have write permissions to write data on a level which is below than you. The third model says that, right, there is strong star property. Strong star property. Which means that on the same level, right, on the same level, you can do whatever you want. You are free to do whatever you want until you have the valid need to know. Which means that if this is person one on the system, this is person two on the system, they both relate to the same level, right? Then they can exchange files, they can share files, they can access files, everything is there until there is valid need to know. If there is a need to know for this guy to a particular folder which is there on this level, he can have access to that. But if the valid need to know is not there, then this person, even if he is on the same level, should not be able to access the information. So that is what is your Bella Padula model. Okay, this model, you must understand, you should note down, it is the model which only supports confidentiality and it does not address integrity, known reputation and those kind of stuff. Also, this model does not help you to uh, you know, address covert channel. What is covert channel? Covert channel is a kind of hidden communication. When a communication happens without the uh, proper way, right, in the, in the backend, then it is called as covert channel. So, 
this model is not able to prevent that over channel. If you understand these things, you are good from an exam perspective. If you have certain questions related to this particular topic, please feel free to put it on the chat. I'm going to take it up during the end of the session. Okay. BIBA integrity model is the another model and it is completely reverse of BIBA integrity. Uh, it is completely reverse of Bella Padula model. Right. Now, how is this more important? This model is called as integrity model. Please understand. This is called as integrity model. So what goal we are fulfilling? We are going to fulfill integrity through this. Now, when we think about integrity, what are the different aspects of integrity? One of the important aspects of integrity is accuracy of information. So if you think this particular model from an accuracy perspective, you will be prompt on bang on to understand this particular model and it's fairly simple as well right just like bella, bella padula there are three properties here right simple read property star or integrity uh, property and invocation property so let's try to understand that the first property says that now here also because it is lattice based model so we have users on different different levels and we have documents also on different different classification and clearance level. Now, what happens is the first rule says that uh, simple integrity axiom. Axiom is nothing but rule, right? Simple integrity axiom, which means that if a person is there on one level, let's say this user is on a secret level, right? He should not be able to read a file. Uh, he should not be able to write a file at a confidential level. Sorry, he should not be able to read a file at a uh, confidential level. Why is it so? Have you thought about this? Why is it so? See, the idea here is taking decisions. And when you take some decisions based on wrong data, based on inaccurate data, your chances of getting, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the security goes for a toss, simple as that. So if let's say a manager is referring to a data which is there for an analyst, right? This data at an analyst level will not be high integrity. The, the integrity and the accuracy of the information will not be that high. If this guy reads this information at this level, there is high chances that he's, his decision making may get impacted. Once his decision making get impacted, this will lead to the entire system getting impacted. So that is called as simple integrity axiom. The next rule is called as star, uh, star integrity axiom or property, which is kind of very simple. Person on one level should not be able to modify information on a level higher than this. And you will all agree with me, this is what we don't want to have. So this is uh, integrity uh, breach otherwise. The integrity is being played up otherwise. So that is your second rule, star integrity axiom. And the third property is kind of very, very important, which says that a process, even a process on a low security level should not be able to invoke a process on a high security level until let authorized. So this makes sure that a low level application, which is low on trust, should not access a high trust application, just like your kernel process and all of that. If they have to do it, they have to go through a validation process. They have to go through a validation process or access control process, which will actually do some validation on it. So that is your invocation property. Very simple to understand. Let me quickly summarize this particular model for you. I don't think you need anything more than this from exam perspective. First thing is, it's an integrity model, right? It is focused on integrity. Security goal is integrity. Second thing, the three axiom or three properties, just understand that it is completely reverse of Bella Padula. You should not be able to read uh, below your level. 
because this may impact your decision making that is called as simple integrity axiom you should also not be able to write on a higher security level because that way unmistakably unmist or by error you may modify some files which is very very important and then the third is a process on a low security level should not directly access a particular process on a high security level they have to go through some validation and they have to go through certain process that is called as BIPA integrity model wonderful so let's go ahead and talk about Lipner model which is the next one here Lipner model is kind of very very simple it is nothing but in real life example for example in your windows system right we actually implement both of these models we implement biba security model as well and uh, you know bella padula model as well so in most of the implementation these two models are implemented uh, at one place based on the situation and that is called as lipner model okay so lipner model is very very simple I see some chat as well. Yeah, so Paris, they are definitely used in real world. Otherwise, there is no point of having a model. Okay, and we'll talk about that during the end of the session as well. Let me go and talk about some more models which are based on rule, right? And first of the, I think this we already understood. Let's talk about this Clark Wilson model first, and then we will go to Greenberg Dash. So, what is Clark Wilson model? Clark Wilson model is very simple. It says that, uh, and I will I will use an example to explain this. Right? Let's say you want to book a air ticket, and you are going to make my trip, and you want to book a ticket. Right? Does make my trip allow you to directly go and book a ticket on their database? Will they give direct access to their database? Answer will be no. Nobody will give you will give you direct access to the database. As simple as that. So how what should we do in that case? Because we have to get the job done. To get the job done, when a user reaches out to make my trip, right? You have to use an intermediate website. Okay, intermediate website or maybe a database view or whatever. To make sure that the user is restricted to this particular website or the view. Why is it so? Is it so because the user who is coming from internet, he can be a good guy, he can also be a bad guy. He may give you very good quality data. He may also give you some bad data. That means some malicious script and those kind of stuff. Those kind of data is called as, un, uh, you know, uh, UDI that is called as UDI un unconstrained data item right to convert this UDI because you can put up anything but when you go on a particular website when you fill up a ticket on the make my trip website when you have to fill up age you cannot fill up uh, the name obviously so that means there are certain security policies which are implemented on that right so this that website is what we are calling out here is transformation process and this transformation process will also have one more process which is called as integration integrity verification process which means that when you access make my trip website and you want to book a ticket first you need to log in first you need to authenticate that authentication is nothing but i v integrity verification process once you go to their website you have to fill up data in constraint of their requirement you cannot put your own data right so that is that is the process which is followed in clark wilson model madam can you just put on mute so that we will cover the question at the last okay so this is this is what is called as uh, you know Clark Wilson model in which when a UDI data comes to the picture, it has to go through a transformation process. It has to go through an integrity verification process. And then as per the security policies implemented on this transformation process, 
we make sure that udi is converted into constrained data item that means which can be pure and can go in your database these three things is called as you know uh, this entire arrangement is part of the clark mission model there is one very very important aspect uh, from exam perspective which you need to uh, remember one thing there is always well formed transactions well formed transaction means you have to go through a particular way you have to go through a set order to achieve a particular transaction that is just now what we understood okay so this is called as well formed transactions the second thing is enforced separation of duties how separation of duties is enforced in this the person who is using is different the person who will be handling this transformation process will be different the person who will be managing this integrity verification process will be different and the person who is managing this particular database will also be different this make sure that a particular critical process end to end is not owned by a single person and will not lead to a fraud because when a particular person is managing a process end to end there is high chances that a fraud will happen so that is why this is very very important to implement separation of duties the last point here is incorporate audit that means monitor monitor all the request which is coming uh, to this transformation process getting verified and then getting committed in the database so this way any of the database can be make my trip let it be any database in the world we never expose our uh you know database directly to the users instead we we let them go to a website or let them go to a restricted view there they can fill it up they can drop they can select from the drop down they can do those queries to the database and can get their work done so that is what is called as clark wilson model it is based on certain rules it is based on integrity verification process that is why we are calling it as a rule based system the next model is brewer nash model right and this very interesting model actually right we also call it as chinese model or chinese wall model right this particular model one keyword you should never forget is conflict of interest what does this conflict of interest means is this right at work for example there is a i will give you an example let's say there is a small company who is giving some managed services to some of the clients and some of these clients are banks bank 1 and bank 2 are competitors they are competitors to each other now what happens is when their accounts need to be accessed by this particular client right somebody sitting here has to access it if one single person is able to access both the clients and these two clients are competitor to each other there is high chances that a fraud may happen and this user may pass on some information related to client uh, you know client 2 to client 1 and client 1 to client 2 now on a process basis definitely we will rule out a policy that a particular person cannot uh, serve two different clients who are working on the same or you can say those are competitors to each other but how do we replicate the same thing in the design phase as well to make it design effective the model is brewer nash model so what happens in this model is the data item let's say this is competitor 1 this is client 1 this is client 2 and they are competitor to each other what we will do we will take over their data they will take over their, their data set and we will give a particular tag number similarly here also we will give a tag number and we will mark it in the back end there will be a rule which will make sure if somebody is accessing this particular tag they will not be able to access this particular tag and this rule 
will be dynamically created by if, if and else statements. So when a particular user by mistake is going to access this particular uh, bank, he will not be automatically able to access another bank. This way, we are making sure that conflict of interest, any chance of conflict of interest on the ground level itself from a technology perspective itself, we are able to control it. So that is why it is also called as a Chinese wall model because this is dynamic in nature. This is purely dynamic in nature. All these rules are created in real time. And you will see this at many places. Uh, for example, if in, in, a, in an environment where uh, people need to give services to multiple clients and all, if you are going to access one client, automatically your access to the other thing will be. So that is how the implementation of Driver Nash model, or we can call it as Chinese wall model as well. I hope you understood that. Let's go to the last uh, some models as well here. So we also have Graham Denning model and HRV model. I don't see they are highly highly important, but yes, there is something in the CBK, so we need to understand that. So this Graham Denning model is basically more focused on the integrity of the access rights. Okay, this is focused on integrity of access rights okay it is basically a computer security model it is basically a computer security model which talks about subject objects and in between their access rights so i hope by now you might be able to uh, make an imagination this is nothing but something called as a access control matrix or access control list. So in this, we are going to maintain a table with the subject name and file, uh, you can say object number, and we can say, okay, read access, read write access, read write ex execute access. So it creates a access control list. There are a total of eight operations which can happen through the grand tenning model, which includes you know, uh, creation of a particular object, deletion of a uh, object, and assigning different rights. But in this, we cannot grant, we cannot grant a user power to alter a particular user. They can go and do the alteration on the object, but they cannot go and do the alteration on the subject by itself. That is what is called as gram denning model. And that is why it is used in distributed systems a lot. For example, uh, websites and those things where you may find that the data is processed by different computers. In those models, Graham Denning model is the best one. However, it has certain limitation as well, because what if I want to make you as an admin and then you should be able to make some changes. That, that feature is not there in Graham Denning model. You can anyways, because I am admin, I can go and create a particular object. I can delete a particular object. I can give you write access. I can give you read access, whatever I want. But I cannot create another user or give you the right to change everything or make you the admin. That is not available in Gram Tending model. What is available in HRU model? So HRU model is nothing but a successor of Gram Tending model. The limitation of the grand dining model was addressed in HRU model, basically. And this is much more simple, much more lightweight. And in this, what happens is, uh, you it is it is an access control model, basically. It's a access control model, and it supports discretionary access control. Discretionary means I am the I am the owner for something. It is my uh, whatever file I create, whatever the thing I create, I am the owner of it. And it is up to my discretion to whom I want to share my file. That is called as discretionary access control. So this is based on the idea of again access metrics, just like this one as well. And it allows for the creation and deletion of subjects and objects as well as modification of access rights. So in this, not only you can create a particular user or delete a particular user, you can also go and, you know, uh, 
create or delete the subjects as well, which was not there in Graham Denning model. So that's the major mode, major difference. What you need to understand from the exam perspective, instead of eight process, as in the case of Graham Denning, we only have six process, and in this we can uh, you know have uh, some rights for creating the user, deleting the user, modifying access rights, and so forth. More suitable for discretionary access control. If you if you ask me some example, you use Windows machines as well. That is where it is up to the discretion of the user by itself. If you yourself are the admin having the right level of privileges, you can make further users as well. You can delete a particular object. You can create a particular object. You can change the access control list on that particular object. Everything is available to you. So in one way, you are using HRU module there. So I hope this slide might have given you clarity between Graham Denning and HRP. Now, uh, just a bit of, uh, you know, pitch here. If you guys are, you know, interested uh, to get your CISSP cracked within the shortest time and the, with the best possible way uh, and in, in your first attempt, then I am here to help you out. Uh, if you are committed to yourself, I am committed towards you. And that's, that's my funda. That's my, you know, KRA here. Now, uh, Madam, would you like to cover this up? See, uh, what you need for your CISSP success. Uh, we uh, have a plan, which we call it as a Mission CISSP 100 Days Toolkit, you know, where uh, you will be availed with the very, uh, you know, in a very structured manner, created videos and um, the study notes, which we have created to solve the purpose of our candidates. So, they, so no need for them to go and read those, uh, you know, huge books and all. So we have a very uh, specific and very structured and very targeted study material where you have to simply follow that path. We provide you with the mind map how to track your CISSP in three months. So that mind map is available with us, right? And uh, we have a good project plan. So if you are like 100% dedicated towards your goal, so undoubtedly uh, you are going yeah. to track so ma'am, let, let me explain this uh, portion because I have created that for you, right? First thing, what you get in the market is, you know, all the training. There are a lot of training providers who give you CISSP training, right? First and foremost, they are bootcamp training. And for CISSP real success, you don't need bootcamp training. You need something which is end-to-end -end preparation. And with that intent in mind, I have created this 100 days toolkit program in which you will have a perfect project plan for your next 100 days. Which means that your target for each and every day is defined. You don't need to get overwhelmed. You don't need to think how my journey is going. Everything is kind of taken care of. You just consume small bits of the data every day. Small bit of information every day. Do brainstorming, practice question. Everything is inside the course, right? So every day, you have to just go cover everyday target. And every Saturday, Every Saturday or Sunday, whatever like your batch is, we are going to sit with you. I'm going to live discuss with you all what you have learned in that particular week. And we are going to practice a lot of questions as well. So that is the perfect way to actually go and clear your CISS. You are going to get a complete access to the LMS for one year. Right? Uh, for one year, there are weekly classes which will be taken up by me. I will be explaining you everything in detail and those classes are very, very interactive. You will have inbuilt notes which are created inside the program itself. You don't need to go and read heavy books and all because I know reading is not everybody's cup of tea. So that thing is also kind of taken care of. Then you have to practice quiz because it's a three-headed approach. You are going to see my videos. You are going to listen to my lectures you are going to practice questions at the same time. So these three things has to happen in simultaneously 
because this is something which I have understood after six years of my teaching CISSP. Right? I am one of the highest endorser for ISC2 at this point of time. I have myself endorsed 78 applications. So you can understand I have been very, very successful till now. The thing is, I want to take this game to a different level and have more and more people get certified. And that is why I'm coming up with this particular plan. Right? You also get support from CISSPs. We have at least 50 CISSPs with us who got certified from me, which are part of the same WhatsApp group. And you become part of that. So anytime you can reach out to any one of them for any kind of mentoring. So we there is a strong support you are going to get in that particular area. And then if somehow you join us today and maybe let's say you have some work commitment, you have some family, family challenges, it happens. Uh, you can't avoid it because that is something is not under your control. And then what happens is your rhythm is broken. In that case, what will happen is you are going to get freely enrolled into your next batch. No question asked. If you are attending this session, you can anyways next also, you know, next batch also is free for you. 